Hello guys, welcome back to Seven Engineering YouTube channel. Please subscribe our channel for daily Seven Engineering videos. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss the design steps for an RCC beam. So there are seven important steps in the designing of an RCC beam. So starting from the first step, which is the selection of the beam size. Selection of beam size. This will be our first step in the design of an RCC beam. So what are the dimensions of the beam size? For example, what are the thickness, are the height of the beam and what is the width or the breadth of the beam? So let's suppose I consider this is a beam and this is a simply supported beam of length L. So what would be its cross-sectional dimension? The height or the thickness of the beam and the width of the beam. These are unknown to us. In the first step, we have to take the uh, we have to select the height or thickness and the width of the beam. So how we can find these? These depends on different codes. For example, according to the ACI 13, 3, 18, 14, they recommend the different thickness of the beams depending on the type of the beam. If it is a simply supported beam, so we can find the thickness of the beam by this formula, L by 16, where L is this span of the beam. If it is a cantilever beam, the cantilever beam, then we this is L, so we can find the thickness of the beam by this formula, L by 8. Now we know the length, we put in this formula, we find the thickness of the beam. So these are according to the ACI. Now what about the width? Width can be found by this formula, that is width is equal to the height divided by 1.5. We know that the height, we find out from this formula, and then we put height here, divided by 1.5, we get our B value. So this was just general example to how to find out the width and height or thickness of the beam depending on the codes. Here I just simply use the ACI codes which they provide the two formulas for the simply and cantilever beam. They also provide the different formulas for one in continuous beam and two in continuous beam. You can find specific video for this lecture on my YouTube channel. Now the next step is the, after selection of the beam size, the next, next step is the load on the beams. That which type of load are acting on your beam? Whether your beam is subjected only to dead load or it is also possible that your beam, there are some live loads acting on your beam. So let's suppose if this is my beam, so it is only subjected to the dead load or maybe it is also subjected to some live load or maybe concentrated load acting on the beam. So the second step is to find out that how much loads are, which type of the loads are acting on your beam. So there are mostly dead load and live load. And, and according, to the, uh, according to the standards, we can also find the combined factored load on your beam. For example, according again, according to this standard, they use that you can find the com bind ultimate load by this formula 1.2 dead load plus 1.6 live load so this is the from this formula we can find out our maximum load acting on the beam we amplify this load by 1.2 dead load and 1.6 the live load because we want to have some factor of safety by increasing these loads so the next step is the loads on beam that how much loads are acting on our beam. This was just an example considering the ultimate case. This also different, this also depends on your code. For example, if you are using indent code, then you cannot use this equation, but you have to use your indent standard. But this was just an example. So the second step was the loads on the beam, considering the all type of the load acting on the beam. The third step is the analysis of the beam. By analysis of the beam means that we have now to draw the shear force diagram for the beam and bending moment diagram for the beam. For example, this is our beam and there is a load acting on the beam. So now we have to draw a shear force and bending moment diagram. So for this uniformly distributed load acting on this beam, let's suppose we have the shear force in this way and the bending moment in this way. So we have to find out the maximum shear here, maximum shear and also here will be maximum shear 
and from this diagram, it's a bending moment diagram, we will have maximum bending moment at this point. This is just an example how to analyze the beam. But maybe your beam is different from the simply supported beam. But the main thing is that you have to draw the shear force diagram and bending moment diagram in order to find the maximum shear value and maximum bending moment value. So after the third step or fourth step is the design of a beam. This is the most important step in our beam in which we design our reinforcement for our beam. So it is again composed of two parts. In first part A, we have to find out the area of a steel bar. Area of a steel bar required. That is A S. So how much area is required for this beam in order to take the load? So this is the this will be considered in the design step. So this area is, is unknown to us and we have to find this area and how much this area in order to take the maximum bending moment. For the shear force diagram or the maximum shear, the second step will be stirrups requirement. And stirrups requirement means that in how much spacing we should provide our stirrups. For example, this is our beam. So we should provide stirrups throughout the beam and this we determined from our shear force diagram that how much its value and accordingly we should provide the minimum spacing between the stirrups. So the stirrups reinforcement depend upon the shear force diagram and the area of the steel bar requirement, the main longitudinal bars depend on the bending moment value. So after the design step, we should go into the next step, which is the checking the deflection criteria. This is also important because if this criteria doesn't meet, we should not continue our design of the beam. So for example, for our dead load, our criteria, our deflection should must be less than this value. Length of the beam divided by 240. For live load, it is equal to the L divided by 360. So our deflection should be less than this value for live load and for dead load, it should be less than this value. If they were not less than these values, so we have to increase the dimension of the beam in order to increase its uh, strength and increase its resistance to the load. After the fifth step, the next step, the sixth step would be checking the area of steel bar that either our area requirement are according to the standards or not so our area reinforcement requirement here it is should be greater than the is minimum the minimum area requirement for a beam and also should be greater than the is minimum and should be less than the is maximum so our reinforcement area should be in between this range. It should not be greater than the ace maximum in order to avoid the brittleness of the beam. And it should also be greater than the ace minimum in order to avoid the failure in the beam. So these were the six important steps. The seventh step will be the checking for the torsional stresses. Checking for the torsional stresses of a beam. So these were all the important steps required for the design of an RCC beam. Hope you guys understand and don't forget to subscribe our channel for daily civil engineering videos. Thank you for watching our video.